Hey, what's up, Jason? We got Jason Langer in the chat, everybody. Hey, hey. Jason. Hey, Jason, you're going to have to make us some, some RAS cookies. Yes. We'll give you a real difficult one, like a lineatus or something. We'll test your, your culinary slash baking RAS knowledge skills. So we're just going to take a couple minutes here and uh, let some people trickle in while we show you some eye candy. We've got a couple of four foot sections ready today. Got some awesome RAS in our facility here. And then we're going to be taking you a little bit further into our facility to show you some other uh, awesome tanks we got set up with some other great uh, specimens. section we got set up today. started here. Go ahead and let these gentlemen introduce themselves. You've never met them before, you know who they are. Hey everybody, happy Friday. It's I, Eric Radai, here with the, the sire of Sarah Labris. All Things Rest, our, our director and illustrious leader, Kevin Cohen. Hey, how's everybody doing today? So we, we've managed to get, break Kevin away from his desk and talk about some of his favorite fish, which are fairy wrasses. Uh, so wrasses, are, are in the Labrid family. There's over 600 species and over across 81 different genera. And one of those genera we're going to be talking about today are Cirro Labris. So without further ado, I will mm -hmm. let Ian show you some of these beautiful wrasses and Kevin can talk about them as we feed them. Okay, let me jump across here right here. Yeah. So, you know, fairy wrasses are an incredible group of fish. So, you know, the reason that, the reason why I like fairy wrasses the most, um, is they're super colorful fish. They're very active fish. Um, so they're great in reef aquariums. And there's a, a huge diversity of, of species of wrasse called fairy wrasse of the genus Cirolabris. So there's almost 60 recognized species of, of fairy wrasse now. Um, and they range in price, you know, anywhere from say $30 all the way up to, you know, over several thousand dollars. So. You know, there's definitely a fairy wrasse out there for for everyone's budget and for everyone's even skill level um, as a marine aquarist. So, um, again, you know, fairy wrasse, I would consider them not very delicate. They're they're a fairly hardy and robust um, genus of fish. Um, and again, great for reef tanks to add color diversity and uh, and activity um, in most reef aquariums. Yeah, and you know, wrasses range in size anywhere from three to eight inches. So depending on your species, we recommend a minimum aquarium size of 50 gallons and upwards of 150 or more, obviously, for some of the bigger species like Scots, uh, Lineatus. And as you can see, you can keep fairy wrasses together. It, it can be tricky, it can be kind of like African cichlids. And if there are wrasses that species that look too similar to each other, they might fight or quarrel. So a lot of time, it's it's putting things in at the same time, 
and timing, and obviously and watching over everybody while they're acclimating, maybe securing the lights, maybe rearranging some rock work. Kevin, do you have any tidbits you want to add to that? I mean, for, for aquariums that are smaller, say in the 50 gallon range, you know, you want to try to stick with some of the smaller um, smaller species of, of Sierra Labrus wrasse. You know, there's actually one in this tank in particular that's actually really great, great fish for a smaller reef aquarium. Um, and that guy's called Sierra Labrus adornatus, or the decorated wrasse. And that fish is right here. It's got these, these gorgeous pink little markings with a red dorsal fin. Uh, another great smaller specimen for say a 50 gallon aquarium is actually in the tank right next to us here. Sorry, Ian, to make right. a roll Thanks over you. here. No um, that fish in the corner there is called Sierra Laborus Lubbockai. It's the Lubbock's rats. And they're, you know, they're, they hail out of Indonesia and the Philippines. What's really cool about Lubbock's rats is they're actually, their markings and coloration is different from the ones that are endemic to Indonesia versus the ones further north that are more endemic to say the Philippines. So yeah, same even same even species. Top, top one in Guinea too. Yeah. And, and Kevin, just to touch on these wrasses you just talked about, what's nice about these two is these are affordable wrasses. They're they're under a hundred bucks. Definitely. You know, Lubbock's wrass is probably the most common serial labor's wrass that folks uh, starting into the hobby will get into. Another kind of more common one that's, sorry to, oh, no, he's right here. Oh, I got Good. one over here. Yeah, there's Sierra Labra Celerinensis, oh, yeah. which is called the Redhead Solon Fairy Wrasse. Mm -hmm. And that's another very, very affordable um, Sierra Labra Wrasse that comes out of Asia. Um, it's a gorgeous colored fish with, you know, hence the, the, the red head, called Redhead Solon Fairy Wrasse. Oh, yes. Got a really cool green body with a, with a, like a dark blue or purple stripe up its dorsal fin and, and on its uh, operculum. So. And it, it's got a good temperament too. We had one in the studio for a while. We did a video on the Solarensis and he got along well with everybody. It's just a nice wrasse. And again, it's a great price point and it's a beautiful fish. And you know, it'll, it'll keep changing colors as it gets older. And just since so Ian can stay in this tank here, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of uh, you know go through some of the some of the really cool wrasse that we have in this aquarium yeah, here. Um, this this darker colored one towards the bottom, actually shooting across, is called Bruneus, Sierra Labrus Bruneus, or the Bruneus Fairy Wrasse. Um, this guy coming towards the front right here is called a Piles Wrasse, Sierra Labrus Pileye, named after Richard Pyle, Dr. Richard Pyle. Um, what's cool about Piles Ras is this Ras right here is out of Asia, this Piles Ras. There is another Piles Ras, which is out of the South Pacific, primarily Vanuatu, which is the same species. However, it has a uh, different coloration than this fish. Uh, Piles Ras are known for, unfortunately, as pelvic fins aren't down, but Piles Ras have a very long pelvic fins which oftentimes will extend all the way to its caudal fin, to its tail, oh, wow. which is really unique for um, a Sierra Labrus. So, um, and as we're talking about colors and different coloration, like with the Lubbocks or with the Piles wrasse, um, Sierra Labrus wrasse are, are uh, they're called dichromatic, which means that the coloration of males oftentimes is different than the coloration of females. So. You know, really fascinating trait of, of all Sierra Labrus wrasse is that they're um, dichromatic, um, which is which is cool because you can tell the difference between sex between male and female. Yeah, and some of them too are even dimorphic, which means they're different in shape. So the males usually get bigger, and some of the Sierra Labrus species they can even get a humped back. And then Kevin, if we want to take that one level further, we can talk about how wrasses are all born protogenous hermaphrodites. Yeah, so, so wrasses of the genus Sierra Labrus are, are protogenous hermaphrodites, which means that when they're first born, that they, they have no um, sexual reproductive organs. So they're either um, juveniles or, or unsexed. Um, as they mature, they'll turn into a female. Um, they're an, a hermatic fish, which means that they live in groups out in the wild. Um, and what's really interesting and unique is that once they turn female in that little group or harem, the most dominant fish in, the, in that harem will transition into a fully functioning male. And that's where it turns into maybe a little bit different color where we call it the initial phase, where it's starting to transition 
into a different phase in life. Um, and again, the, the biggest, most dominant fish in that group or harem will, will be what's called terminal phase, where it'll turn into a, a fully functioning male um, that displays bright, vibrant male colorations. This Sierra Labos Jordani flame wrasse is a great example. That's an awesome terminal phase male. You can see it's got a bright, bright yellow body, um, really bright orange and red dorsal fin with a, a bright red uh, caudal fin. Just a spectacular specimen. And I think that's what, that's what all of us like about Sierra Labos wrasse is that you know, these fish will turn into males and they'll exhibit this really, really incredible coloration as a male. Yeah, you know, just, just absolutely beautiful. And going back to dimorphic in shape too, males typically have longer fins as well. You bet. Yeah, the, the dimorphism, you know, it could, it could be that their, you know, caudal fin gets lunate or a, or a forked shape, or it could be a teardrop shape, um, or their dorsal fin could be, you know, higher or longer, um, or their pelvic fin fins could be elongated. So that, that's, that's the dimorphism um, in, in the RAS of the genus Sierra Labra, so. Great, I'm gonna chime in here real quick with a question from Chad. Uh, we got a question from Dynac, I hope I say that name right. Uh, what's the difference between a terminal and a super male RAS? A terminal phase male and a, and a super male are the same thing. So okay. a super male is a, a, a fully functioning dominant male in the, in the harem. Um, and it's a, what we would we would term as a terminal phase male or even a super male. So, cool. Yeah, we've got Thanks a nice nice lineatus in here, and he's definitely super male terminal. Oh, that yeah. guy right down there is beautiful. He's got all sorts of just beautiful purple and pink, kind of rose colored oh, yeah. pastels. He's got those orange eyes, and we got the little adrenals showing off in front there. And so Ian's on this tank right here. You know, we've got um, exquisitus ras. This guy with the red head and the kind of green body, um, kind of going upwards yep. to the left there. Okay. Um, what's cool about Cyrillabrus exquisitus is there's about six or seven different color morphs of this fish, and their their distribution um, is all throughout the Central and South Pacific, all through the Western Pacific, um, from Indonesia, and then even further west into the Indian Ocean, where you even see different. Um, differently patterned and marked and colored um, exquisitus wrasse. So anybody that's really into this uh, this species of Cyrillabris, um, it's really important to actually take a look at all the different color patterns and color morphs depending on the exact location of harvest. Really incredible fish. Yeah, and to Kevin's point, with lots of the species, there are different variants like that. Going back to that exquisite wrasse, that's another beautiful wrasse that's under 100 bucks. Nice. You bet. So what are we feeding? I was gonna say, what are we feeding these guys today? To make sure everybody's aware. We are feeding a combination of brine shrimp and mysis shrimp. And, and one real simple but important tip to know about when you're feeding this stuff, a lot of times the, the prepared foods are packed with vitamins or gut loaded, so you don't want to over rinse them. Really, what we do here in the facility is we just thaw it out and we put it in a bottle or we have it in a cup or we can scoop it in with a spoon because you don't want to wash away all those nutrients. Cool. Yeah, Eric brings up a great point in that, you know, you just want, you want the food to fall and then you want all the, the liquid from that frozen food to just, to just drain out because you don't want to add that liquid to your, and all those nutrients to your display aquarium. However, you don't want to rinse it um, heavily in say RO water and, and you know, basically denutrient all the food that you're trying to feed. Sierra labrus wrasse are very, very active fish. Um, their habitats range actually, it's quite diverse, their habitats. You know, some species are kind of on, you know, uh, inside of the reef areas in more shallow water in groups, where others are found on the outside of the reef, on, even in very, very deep water. So on the outside of the reef, more on a, a rocky reef environment that could go uh, to depths upwards of, of five or 600 feet deep. So. You know, depending on the species and depending on, um, the, you know, the, the, the complex of fairy wrasse that we're looking at would, would be pretty much determine the different habitats that they're normally accustomed to. And yeah, to Kevin's point, they are very, very active fish. And if you're going to have these, you definitely need to feed them at least a couple times a day. Cool. You know, a lot of folks ask, you know, do, do I have to feed frozen food to, to wrasse and to antheus and other, you know, highly active fish? Um, if you can convert some of these fish onto a prepared diet, like a, a, 
a very good quality pelleted diet, that's great if they'll, they'll take, take that up. Um, ideally, you know, you want to vary their diet considerably. So if they can eat pellet food, that's awesome. Uh, but also supplement their diet with a really high quality enriched frozen diet of, of say mice and shrimp. PE mice and shrimp is a, a great food to feed these guys. Um, so it's things like San Francisco Bay and Akari um, enriched uh, brine shrimp is also a very good food for all these different types of zero labor stress. They are planktonivorous fish, which means that they actually eat um, kind of plankton on the outside of the water column. Unlike other wrasse that kind of hunt and pick through the sand for, uh, say, copepods or, or you know other small crustaceans, um, these guys not so much. They're 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 more eating eating planktonic you know food sources out of the water column. Quick, quick question from the uh, from the chat from Mike. Stats say they might eat urchins. Does this differ by size or does it matter? So that these that serolabrus might eat urchins. Yeah. Um, I've never seen a serolabrus rat um, go after or try to eat an urchin. Um, however, you know some species of urchins really like to take substrate and gravel and everything else and kind of surround their bodies with their tube feet with with substrate and other you know maybe pieces of algae things like that. It's, it might not be unusual for maybe a serolabrus rat to say. Boy, that, that piece of algae that's stuck to that urchin looks good. I'm gonna I'm sure. gonna try to eat that. For accidental. Um, yeah. It's totally coincidental. Yeah. So they, they normally would never go after um, urchins. As far as crustaceans, you know, we, we, we always say that serial labor serafts are reef safe. Um, granted, if you have things like a really tiny sexy shrimp or you've got some really, really tiny crustaceans in the tank, they might try to go after them, but it's very, very unusual and uncommon for that to happen. So again, if you're just joining us, this is our live feed. We're, uh, we're coming to you from the Coral Farm Live Aquaria here at our Wisconsin facility. We've got Kevin Cohen with us, and we're talking about fairy wrasses today. And again, fairy wrasses are labyrinths. Uh, they're, they come from the family of Labridae, and there are 600 different species over 81 different genres. And this is just one of the genres or genuses we're looking at, serolabrous wrasses, or fairy wrasses as they're commonly and affectionately known as. Hey, let's let's talk a little bit about price point of wrasse. So, you know, a lot, a lot of folks say, you know, why is this Lubbock's wrasse a $30 wrasse? And, you know, why is that Lineatus wrasse a, a $300 wrasse? And, you know, the, a, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of variables that go into determining the, the price point of, of marine fishes. When we're talking about Sierra Labor's wrasse like these guys in here, um, Wrasse that are in big densities in, in, in shallow water environments that are very easy to harvest, um, those normally are wrasse that are much, much more affordable. When we start to get to wrasse that are found on the outside of, of the reefs that are in a little bit more deep water, yeah. you know, this, this flame wrasse is a, a great example. Those are, are found in much deeper water, um, around 150 feet if not more. Um, of course, it takes a lot more effort um, to actually dive to those depths and to harvest these uh, these animals in a sustainable manner with nets and then to decompress them to bring them back up to the surface um, in a very safe and, and effective manner so that we're not damaging these fishes um, and then when they're brought back to the export facility that they're handled properly so you know it really depends on the habitat in, in regards to pricing it depends on the depth and it also depends on um, the location of export. So some of these fishes are found in very remote regions around the world. Um, and, and when they're found in remote regions around the world, normally the price point is, is much, much higher. You know, it's a very limited collection in some areas. And, and there's very limited flights that, that leave some of these remote regions. Um, for example, Madagascar or Mauritius or, you know, places that, you know, there are not a lot of major airlines fly in and out of, so. And, and finding the skilled labor to, to collect these. You bet. I mean, for experienced sure. divers. For sure. For shallow water species, I mean, it's, it's a lot easier. I mean, some of the stuff, stuff can be harvested even with snorkel, whereas deep water species, of course, you, you need very skilled, well-trained divers so that folks are safe. Um, and even in some respects, very, very deep water wrasses, it's not uncommon that they've been collected or harvested uh, responsibly with mixed gas rebreathers. So, you know, these are, are 
dedicated expeditions that are very costly to do, um, and you know it's obviously very costly to, to go to that depth as well. So, yeah. real quick question from the chat: um, How is Kevin's half-banded flasher ass doing? Well, you know what? If you, if you hang in there, you might see it in about That's 10 true. minutes. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, we're going to segue into, uh, you know, since I'm such a RAS head, the RAS <laughs> aficionado, um, I love uh, Ferry and Flasher RAS. Um, I think we'll end this. Uh, we'll we'll take, a, take a little stroll into my office here, and uh, we'll, we'll take a look at uh, a, a couple really cool Flasher RAS. And maybe we'll do a segment, Eric, next on Flasher yeah. RAS. Who knows? Maybe. Well, why don't we, uh, we're gonna bounce over to the show tank. We've got our 300 gallon SPS RAS Sanctuary show tank. Kevin's got some more gems in there we can tell you about. And then we'll head into his office and show you a nice little treat or two. All right, I'll follow you guys. Get you guys a little bit of behind the scenes of the farm here. Hey, how you doing, Julio? Oh yeah. Do you like a koi tang? Yeah, this thing's beautiful. Oh, and it's coming through there. All right. Did it come through? No, I don't think so. I think it's oh, too okay. much reflection, but we'll have to get that one another time. All right. So, Kevin, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about this tank. I know it's 300 gallons. I think we've had it a little while, and we have several species of wrasse in here. You bet. This is our, as, as Eric termed, our wrasse sanctuary. Um, this is our, we're really proud of this aquarium. It's a 300 gallon um, old Marineland deep dimension tank. So it's six feet long by three feet front to back by 24 inches tall. Um, as you can see, it's primarily filled with, um, it's an SPS dominated aquarium, primarily filled with Acropora corals, um, as well as some Montipora and a few chalice corals and so forth. Ooh. But this is where, um, you know, this, this can show folks out there that in, with a large enough aquarium, with a densely population or a dense population of, of Cirrolabris wrasse, that you can actually mix several different species together. And the trick to doing that, what we found, is it's very similar to, you know, when I used to keep African cichlids years ago. It's, it's if you just have a few in there, you, you definitely have some hierarchy issues, some dominance issues. Whereas if you densely pack these guys, um, and keep a, a, a diversity of these these cirrolabris wrasse that uh, you put them in relatively close to the same time and then have some maybe some dither fish as distractions things like you know tracy eyed damselfish and some some agile chromis and things like that that really helps to disperse the aggression so kind of go over some of the fish in this display here you know we've got the nahaki's wrasse right here this fish is named after Tony Nahaki. Um, it's found in the South Pacific, primarily in Tonga and Fiji. Um, another cool fish is Cirrolabris isosceles, that pintail wrasse that's going towards the back. Um, that's a relatively new species, newly identified species by my good friend Lemon. Um, he's down in Australia right now um, studying ichthyology. So he's gonna be one of our the next famous ichthyologist to start naming these cool wrasse. Uh, he's super into to fairy and flasher wrasse as well. Um, what else is cool in here? So we've got Cyanogalaris. This is the blue throat wrasse, and unfortunately he's kind of lost that blue throat on him. Uh, but that's another relatively new species of, of wrasse that's been identified for the trade. It's a big magma in back, or a Shutman eye. Oh, yeah. You bet. That Here fish is named after Barnett Shutman of RVS Fish World, and it's called the Magma Fairy Wrasse, a uh, Cirrolabra Shutman eye. Yeah. So, Another beautiful fish. So, Kevin, you mentioned RVS Fish World. Why don't you talk about them and how integral they are and you know how important they are to this industry for people who don't know about RVS Fish World? Yeah, so RVS is in the Philippines, and... and uh, Barnett is the owner of RVS, and it, it does a great job with supplying nets and doing training programs for um, Filipino fishers, uh, which, is, which is awesome. You know, there's a lot of great collectors around the world that sustainably harvest marine, marine ornamentals um, with the proper netting and, and utilizing proper equipment and techniques for harvest. And, and Barnett's um, really integral to supplying um, the proper netting material for a lot of these fishers in the Philippines, which is really, really cool to see. So, What else in here? Another couple uh, 
really neat, neat cereal laborers. So there's Johnson and I right there in the corner. Um, he's kind of swimming down towards the bottom. Cereal laborers, Johnson and I, um, those fish are uh, out of Kwajalein, which is in the Marshall Islands. We've got our Claire's wrasse up top that's um, unfortunately his caudal fins. Uh, he's been receiving, uh, the, he's been the recipient of some aggression from oh. some other folks yeah. in here. That's so. your anecdote about African cichlids. You know, they, they, they establish their hierarchy and there, there are some beatings that happen here and there. We just hope that keep them fed enough and keep that aggression down and keep the mix changing. For sure. Um, there's Cerulebris hydroxorus, the monsoon wrasse, is in here somewhere as well. Um, Eric and I were looking at him earlier today. He must be a little camera shy. There he is, he's under that cave. Okay. He loves to have it out with the Revalulicthes antheus that's in there. They, they <laughs> tend to go back and forth quite often. So, mm -hmm. Some other fish in this aquarium though as well. You know, we've got our, our aberrant yellow tang, which is really neat. We've got our traditional copper-banded butterfly fish for aptasia control. And yeah, this oh, yeah. is a really cool fish called a red lip cleaner wrasse from Tahiti. So um, he's been in here now for probably a half a year. and. He's doing really, really well. Eats oh, brine shrimp and prepared foods, which is which and is really. We cool. actually have a few of those in QT right now. We do. We've so got hopefully uh, within a week or so, four or five of these guys in quarantine right now, and they're all eating prepared foods really, really well. So you know, once we get them through quarantine and uh, get them over to our main fish system, they can be selected to be photographed for the divers' den. Awesome. All right. Well, All right. Without, without further ado, let's have our segue into flasher wrasses. So we're going to make our way through the office area. All right. A little more tour for you guys. So I know I've, I've posted a lot of video um, on our Facebook page in regards to the uh, this uh, awesome flasher wrasse called Nursalum wrasse. So it's uh, Paracolinus Nursalum, and it's actually a new species of, of wrasse for the trade of flasher wrasse. Um, really cool fish I've never seen before in person, but it just keeps getting more stunning and more stunning and more stunning. So he's actually in this aquarium right here um, by himself. Oh, he's a stunner. Yeah, it's just the, the filaments Ooh. off of its caudal fin are just amazing. I'm just surprised that they're even as long as the fish's body itself. Um, as you can see, there's no other fish in this tank, so he's got... Uh, He's got the whole aquarium to himself with nobody that can pick on his quite, uh, quite the digs, you know. Beautiful streamer. So it's it, interesting because he tries to flash to these um, this uh, pair of uh, Centropygi interrupta in this tank here, and also this uh, Paracolinus hemataneatus, which is um, the Madagascar flasher ass, another fish that um, I've never seen in person, um, which is really cool. I mean, it's so fascinating to read books and, and be infatuated with all these wrasse and then it's it's such a an honor to have the opportunity to actually care for one of these specimens or both of these specimens to be honest with you um, so it's really cool so we'll hopefully get some more of these guys we actually just got three nursalum in um, today so hopefully in a couple weeks we're going to get these guys conditioned up and uh, get it's get on the cool. diver's den section of the live aquarium website and we're, we're definitely on the hunt for more of these hematineatus as well, so. And as Kevin was talking about earlier, these wrasses come from very remote regions, so that's why they command a higher price, just because of the labor involved, finding divers and boats that can go out to those areas, and then the supply chain bringing them back. But yeah, he's a gorgeous fish, we've really enjoyed him. So we'd love to get your comments, your suggestions. Um, we really want to keep doing these live feeds and, and kind of focusing on certain types of fish or certain groups of fishes. So please put in your comments what you'd like to see us uh, focus on in, in, the, in the coming weeks and months. Uh, really receptive to, to all our great customers' comments and, and we really want to try to help you know, promote and educate responsible aquarium care and responsible fish keeping. Great. Well, I think that about wraps up for today, huh, guys? All right. Well, thanks, everybody, so much for yeah. joining us. And I personally want to thank uh, John King and Patrick Largy, two of our employees that bust their tails off out in the coral farm. They're responsible for jockeying all those fish around. They had to acclimate them because they had to take them out of QT, which is hyposalinity, bring them up to Maine. So they always work a lot. They're very hard workers, and they're behind-the-scenes guys, and we couldn't do this without them. So thank you, John. Thank you, Patrick. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. You bet. And I want to thank Eric and Ian behind the camera as well. So wish everybody a, a happy weekend and uh, happy fish keeping.